Hey, I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. Welcome to the show. We're starting in the Middle East this Tuesday, where the ISIS terrorist group is making what could be its last stand in Syria. ISIS, which stands for Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, once controlled large parts of land in those two countries after sweeping to power in 2014. But after five years of airstrikes by a U.S.-led coalition of countries, fighting on the ground by local forces, and intervention by militaries around the world, ISIS now controls less than 1% of the territory it once had. And that sliver of land is in a village of eastern Syria. A military group called the Syrian Democratic Forces, with support from the United States, is battling ISIS on the ground, while continued airstrikes rain down from the sky. The U.S. general overseeing the fight against ISIS estimates that between 500 and 1,200 terrorists are in the village and that tens of thousands of them are still spread out across Syria and Iraq. So General Joseph Votel says a defeat at its last stronghold in Syria won't mean the end of the terrorist group, but that continued pressure on it will be necessary. With U.S. troops scheduled to leave Syria at the direction of President Donald Trump, General Votel says that America would continue to look for ways to support the fight against ISIS without the U.S. military on the ground in Syria. The final battle began just after sunset, with coalition airstrikes pounding the last dot on the map held by the state that called itself Islamic. The town of Baghouz al Falkani in eastern Syria. But there was no calm before the storm, as gunners with the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces rained heavy machine gun fire down onto ISIS targets, while civilians who had stuck it out in the town made their way to safer ground. The bombing of the town continued throughout the night, intensifying at first light. The battle to take the last enclave of ISIS in Syria is now into its second day. Syrian Democratic Forces have made good progress within the town, but they are encountering some resistance from the ISIS fighters. This despite the constant heavy coalition airstrikes on the town. But as the day wore on, the going got tougher and the airstrikes increased. It's a hit, he says. ISIS has dug a network of tunnels and trenches, its fighters some of its most experienced and battle-hardened. This battle will not end the war on ISIS when ISIS, the state, is replaced by ISIS, the terrorist insurgency, Jumat, an Arab fighter, tells me. It will be tougher still. This war is easy, he says. We're fighting them on a front. It will be different when it becomes guerrilla warfare. Victory of sorts is at hand. Peace in this tortured land still elusive. Ben Wiedemann, CNN, outside Baruz and Fopeni in eastern Syria. 10 second trivia. In which of these products would you most likely find the organic compound oxybenzone? Sunscreen, gasoline, artificial sweetener, or hand sanitizer? Oxybenzone is commonly found in sunscreen and other cosmetic products. And the city of Key West, Florida has joined the state of Hawaii in banning sunscreens that contain oxybenzone, along with another chemical called octinoxate. Both of these ingredients are used to help protect people from the sun's ultraviolet rays. But some scientists believe that when they wash off people's skin, they're harmful to marine ecosystems like coral reefs. The reefs near Key West are important to both people and wildlife. They contribute to Florida's fishing and tourism industries. They're home to thousands of species of plants, fish, and other marine animals. So the Key West City Commission calls it an obligation to take steps to protect the reefs by eliminating certain sunscreen ingredients. A lot of popular brands, from Coppertone to Neutrogena, will be affected, and some representatives from the sunscreen manufacturing industry say there's still doubt about whether the banned chemicals actually hurt the reefs. Key West is not banning all sunscreens. Mineral products that contain zinc oxide and titanium dioxide will still be allowed. But a consumer report study published in 2017 found they did not perform as well as chemical sunscreens.
And according to the Miami Herald, some dermatologists are concerned that banning oxybenzone and octinoxate could lead to increases in skin cancer. The new laws in both Key West and Hawaii take effect on January 1st, 2021. A new report from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control says there's been a huge jump in the number of American teenagers using electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes. The National Youth Tobacco Survey found that last year, one and a half million more teens used tobacco than the year before, and that the way they did it was through e-cigarettes or vapes. Tobacco contains an alkaloid called nicotine. That's the drug that makes it addictive. Many adult smokers have turned to e-cigarettes to help them quit regular cigarettes, which have more toxic chemicals. But health officials say any form of smoking or vaping is dangerous. The first time I jeweled was at the end of eighth grade. My friend handed it to me and I had no idea what it was. That's 15-year-old Philip Furman speaking at a New York City Council health meeting. When I started hearing all the facts and everything bad about it, it was already too late. I was already hooked onto it. Philip's story has become shockingly familiar. You've probably heard of Juul by now. It's been around since June of 2015. And millions of high school students have already Juuled or vaped using the device. What you may not know, however, is how Juul's high 5% nicotine pods have caused a so-called nicotine arms race across the vaping industry. When Juul came on the market three and a half years ago, the vapor market was mostly 1 and 2% nicotine. It's now 6, 7% nicotine. Now this tiny Juul cartridge delivers to a person's body the same amount of nicotine as this entire box of camels of 20 cigarettes. Stanford professor Dr. Robert Jackler makes his case in a study in the BMJ journal Tobacco Control. His research group has been tracking the industry for nearly a decade. When Juul came out with very high nicotine electronic cigarettes, it triggered a nicotine arms race amongst competitive companies seeking to emulate the success of Juul. Juul is now winning the race. They now control about three quarters of the vaping market in the United States. While federal law prohibits selling these products to minors, Jackler worries that vaping companies like Juul are using new technology to pack more nicotine into their products. There's no regulation of the amount of nicotine in electronic cigarettes. Highly concentrated nicotine solutions are potently addictive, and nicotine addiction is a very difficult addiction to break. I'd be waking up in the middle of the night, I'd have like cold sweats or whatever, it was just not a great experience. And then I think that's when he really understood what nicotine addiction was. Remember, many of these kids have never smoked before and are suddenly being exposed to the same nicotine levels as a full pack of cigarettes without any buildup of tolerance. Juul says it's taken swift action against counterfeit and infringing products and is committed to preventing youth from accessing its products. Juul also says there were products on the market in the range of 4 to 5 percent nicotine before Juul's rise in popularity. But Jackler says the majority of products were much lower when Juul launched, and it was indeed the popularity of Juul that sent nicotine levels soaring. We hear about sixth graders doing it, fourth graders doing it. You know, these kids are facing a lifetime of serious nicotine addiction. I still sometimes crave a Juul, and it's really hard to say no because there are really Juuls everywhere, so it's really hard to fully stop. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN, reporting. <laughs> For 10 out of 10 this Tuesday, we're serving up some frozen fruit. Well, more frozen than fruit. These are called ghost apples. They're a product of both extreme cold and freezing rain in western Michigan. The man who captured them on camera says they formed when ice-coated rotten apples and the fruit itself slipped through as apples have a lower freezing point than water. That left just some icy apple shells hanging on the trees. Of course, ghost apples are only a shell of themselves, but they are aptly named. It must stem or branch from the fruitographer's biting wit, a slice of his intelligence that we're happy to pick, peel, and share on CNN 10. I'm Carl Azus, and how do you like damn apples?